Let's open up our copies of God's Word this morning to Psalm 119. We read the passage earlier. We're going to be in verses 33 through 40 today. And uh, if you're here for the first time in a couple weeks, we are going through a sermon series through the chapter of Psalm 119. And kind of our tagline for this sermon series is delighting in God's Word. And so delight means to find gratification in, to find fulfillment in, to find enjoyment from something, specifically in our case, God's Word. And so that's the theme of this study and also the goal of our study. So my hope and prayer is that as we walk through Psalm 119, God would stir within us a greater delight for His Holy Word. Uh, It's something that we need and it's super helpful to have uh, as we try to live the Christian life. So I want to ask you this morning to start off by just doing some personal reflection. If our goal is to delight in God's word, where would you say you're at in your attempts to delight in God's word? If it's helpful for you, maybe rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. Maybe that's not so helpful. Just, just think in your own mind, how much am I really delighting in? In God's Word. How much room do I have to grow? All of us, no doubt, have room to grow. The question is, how how far can we still progress in our ability to delight in God's Word? Take maybe a step back from God's Word now and think about some of the other things that you might delight in. Right? Some of the things that we delight in. What's true about the things that we delight in is that often we'll talk about those things. Often we engage with the things that we delight in. It's true that the things that we delight in, we would often like to have more of. The things that we delight in, we notice when they're missing from our lives. We notice when we don't get to enjoy them as much as we maybe would like to. Oftentimes, we will be thinking and planning about the next time we'll get to enjoy that thing or that person that we delight so much in. We often will choose that thing or value it above a lot of other things, even over other good things, because that's the thing that we delight in. So I ask you this morning, how much do you find yourself currently delighting in God's word? And then if you're like me, you think, well, man, I have so far to go. More often than not, probably the delight is a struggle. What do we do about that? If we want to delight in God's word, what is, what is some practical ways for us to grow in our delight of his word? That's what this this passage here this morning is going to direct us to, verses 33 through 40. This gives us, there's, there's many things that perhaps we could do in order to grow in our delight of God's word, but this, I think, should be the starting point. And that is to pray to God that he would grow your delight in his word. Ask God for it. If you want to delight in God's word, ask God to do that within yourself. It's probably pretty rare that we could ever conjure up that delight in and of ourselves in the first place. And that's what we see here in verses 33 through 40 of Psalm 119 is the psalmist praying. In fact, in eight verses here, he gives eight requests of God to guide him and direct him to delight in his word just a little bit more. I love this passage because at first glance, when you read through Psalm 119, I don't know if you've ever read through it all in one shot, all in one go, but when you come to the end of it, the the temptation is to think, man, how in the world could I ever delight in God's word as much as the psalmist seems to in Psalm 119? I mean, he doesn't, there's a handful of verses of the 176 verses that don't mention the word of God. And so the temptation is to think, man, The psalmist is like way up here and I need to get on his level. 
right? I, I need to delight more. But the reality is that the more you study the Psalm 119, the more you realize that the psalmist is actually actively engaging in the struggle to delight more and more. He feels the same things that we feel. He feels the same hardships in life, the same circumstances, the same temptations that we do. And I find that so comforting that the psalmist here isn't, isn't fake. He's a real person, just like you and I, who, who are desiring and yearning to grow and are long for the word. And, and what he does so often is he prays to God that he would stir that within his soul. And so the title for the message this morning is Pray Your Way to Delighting in God's Word. Pray Your Way to Delighting in God's Word. Let's just pray ourselves real quick before we dive into the text this morning. God, thank you so much for your holy word. It's living, it's active and powerful. And so we pray that you would let your word and your spirit have its way in our hearts and lives today. Lord, help us to respond to your word. Help us to have soft and moldable hearts to what you might have us to learn today. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So the first prayer that he prays is found in verse 33. The first verse there in this prayer is a prayer that says, teach me. The first prayer is teach me. This is an attitude of the psalmist all throughout Psalm 119, a humble recognition that he needs to be taught the word of God, the promises of God. I mentioned this last week, I think, but so often we, we, we don't come to God's word because we, we think we've read it enough. We know it. We know what there is to, to say. We've, we've heard it all. And the psalmist does not have that attitude. Time and time again, he asks the Lord, teach me. I need to know more. Teach me your word. This word literally means to instruct. You know, in, in school, especially elementary school, but even through high school and college, people always want the good teacher, right? I'm, I'm sad that Steve Bliven isn't here uh, this morning because he, he's the good teacher, right? He's, he's the kind of teacher that everybody at school wants to have. Why? Because the good teachers are teaching the same material but the students learn it better, right? They're good teachers. And so as we come to God's word, as we pray to, to delight ourselves more, the psalmist here says, teach me, O Lord. I need you to teach me your word. I cannot teach, I cannot teach myself properly. I need your help in order to teach me the ways of your statutes. If anybody is able to show us the way by the word, through the spirit, so that we might learn, certainly it's the master himself. Certainly it's God himself. We need his help to teach us his holy word. He says then, the second half of that verse, teach me so that in the end I will keep your word. I will keep it to the end. So the prayer here in verse 1 is, Lord, help me to know with my mind, the things of your word. Help me to know it. Teach me. Verse 34, he then says, grow me. First it's teach me, then it's grow me. He's, he literally says, give me understanding. Give me understanding in verse 34. This is, this is taking that head knowledge maybe a step further. I think of it when, when I was an undergrad and I was learning Greek, uh, roughest two years of my life. Um, they talked about something the first week of our Greek class. Our professor talked about the, the fog. The fog of Greek class. And, and what he was talking about there is he told us that he would teach us things. We would learn things. We would know things one week. But it wouldn't be until several weeks later 
that we actually would understand those things. Even though we knew them and memorized them, it wouldn't be until a couple weeks later that we would start seeing why those things are so important and how they work together in helping to understand the Greek language. And if you've ever learned a language, you probably can relate to that, right? You're learning things and you, and you know things, you know the facts, but it's not until you continue to grow in those things that you really start understanding them and know how they work together intricately. The same might be true when, when you start a new job and you've got new systems and programs and, and things that you have to learn and, and you're learning them and you know them, you see them with your eyes, but it's not until you really get into it and get into the flow of things that you understand all the intricacies therein. This is kind of what he's talking about. If verse 33 is a prayer for head knowledge, then 34 is a prayer for heart knowledge. The psalmist is not simply content with knowing. He wants to really understand. He wants to understand why God's word matters. He says, give me understanding so that not only may I keep your word, as he said in verse 33, but also that I may observe it with my whole heart. You can't do much with your whole heart unless you are absolutely committed to it. And you're not going to be committed to something that you don't completely understand. And so it's super helpful for us to understand so that we can go all in, as it were, without any reservations to observing God's word with our whole heart. We're not giving him a little corner, a little piece, but the whole entire thing. Teach me, grow me. Verse 35 says, lead me. Lead me in the path of your commands. If verse 33 was head knowledge and 34 is heart knowledge, then 35 is about the feet. It's about action. It's about application of the word. Not only does the psalmist here want to know and understand the law, But he also recognizes his need for help in walking in it. Lead me in that path. You've helped me to, you're going to help me know it. You're going to help me understand it. And now help me walk in it. Help me to obey it. It is then, the second part of that verse, that we will be able to properly delight in it. I delight in your word. So lead me down that path. Help me to walk in it. I wonder, when was the last time you prayed a prayer like that? When was the last time you woke up in the morning and just got on your knees and asked God, Lord, help me today to walk in the path of your word. I'm dependent on you. I need your help. For I delight in your word. Notice the progression here. We've seen this before. We're going to see it again. But this progression from knowing to understanding to applying. And with that progression also comes a progression of response, of knowing the word will help me keep it, understanding the word will help me observe it with my whole heart. And as he leads us to obey God's word, we will be able to delight in it. I think this serves as as a reminder to us that it's not mainly about knowing the word, but the blessedness and enjoyment and fulfillment and satisfaction and delight comes when we obey God's word. This is rehashed for us time and time again in the New Testament. You might remember James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves oh what deception there is in knowing much of god's word but following little of it matthew 7 towards the end of the sermon on the mount it's the the wise man built his house upon the rock that passage jesus says everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. You need both parts of the equation. You need to hear the words, but then you also need to do the word. 
You need to obey it. You need to live in it. Apart from the obedience, your house is still on the sinking sand. We can look to the Great Commission, right? We know those verses. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them, what? To observe. It's not just head knowledge. It's, it's just not that we know all of the verses or know all of the commands or know all the do's and don'ts. It's that we observe them. We observe them. Your knowledge of God's word will only take you as far as your willingness to submit to God's word. Your knowledge of God's word will only take you as far as your willingness to submit to God's word. That's why I think there's lots of knowledgeable Bible scholars, even pastors out there, who are not necessarily the most godly people. Right? Just because you know God's word doesn't mean that you're a godly person. It doesn't mean that you've got everything you need. You need to also obey God's word. Knowledge of God's word cannot be a substitute for obedience to God's word. However, in the same breath, let me also say that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? It's more important that I obey God's word than know God's word. Well, more, I'm not sure, because you will not obey what you do not know in the first place. Who has a better chance of obeying God's word, the one who knows it and has it memorized, or the one who doesn't? We can't just say, no, doctrine doesn't matter, study doesn't matter, memorization doesn't matter, because, in fact, we are exhorted in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show, show yourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our Awana clubbers know that one, don't we? We need to know the word, but it cannot stop there. We need to pray these prayers of then lead me in the path. Help me then to observe with my whole heart your holy word. Knowing God's word and not obeying it is maybe the biggest bummer there is known to mankind. I mean, to miss the blessings of God's word by, by 12 inches from the head to the heart. I think, of, I think of delighting in things. And one thing that came to my mind this week is vehicles. Okay, how many of you delight in vehicles? Not very many hands. Okay, there's a couple people. Okay, you enjoy them for what they give to you. Okay, there are people who would be delighted to spend hours in their garage tinkering with their vehicles. Right? It's, it's nice out now. Motorcycles are getting back on the road. Uh, we just, just came out of winter where snowmobiles were the thing. And I think of motorcycles and snowmobiles as, as vehicles that need lots of work and maintenance. You're constantly having to tinker with things, making sure that they work. And interestingly enough, I think the people who maybe understand the ins and outs and intricacies of cars appreciate or snowmobiles or whatever it is they appreciate vehicles they they're able to delight in vehicles more than the average person like me who just sees vehicles as a money pit like i've got to send that thing to the shop we've got to get it fixed that's all vehicles are to me is a big money pit right but but the people who know the rules and how they work Right? They can actually find delight in the tinkering because they know what it's going to lead to. Right? Even if it's not a joyride through the country, it's the sound of that car starting back up. It's, it's bringing life to that vehicle. That's what God's word does for us. It gives us life. And so we can even delight in, in the sometimes meticulous reading of God's word because we know what it leads to. A couple weeks ago I, I went on a I went up to a conference in Louisville and we flew and our our flight got delayed because maintenance, right? There's a mechanical issue with your airplane and every time you hear that you're like, oh come on. 
So we had a late flight and, and this pushed it back so that we didn't know if we'd be able to get our rental car and, and all kinds of things. And so I was just stressed out. I was like, really? Does this have to happen? Initially, my initial response was, come on, I'm sure it's fine, right? Let's just go. <laughs> and you laugh because that's a foolish way to, to interpret that circumstance. No, the, the right way to interpret that circumstance is yes, absolutely, please follow the book to the T. Yeah. Because I don't want to die on my way to Louisville. And yet, so often, our approach to God's word and, and how we allow it to impact our life is the same. This, this God's word as, as our guidebook, as our rule book, as it were, shows us all of the ways to live life. And so often, we, we just think, well, actually, I, I think I've got it figured out. We should be fine. And we leave it on the shelf. What a dangerous, dangerous attitude to live by. Now, every illustration has its shortfall, right? Because, of course, God's word is more than just a rule book. It's, it's more than just a manual for life, right? It's so much more than that. It's a living book. It's an inspired book. book. It's a supernatural book. It's a love letter from God himself. It's the food that nourishes our souls. It's a book that literally gives us life. So how much more then should we cling to it? How much more then should we delight in God's holy word? The psalmist prays, teach me, grow me, lead me, for I delight in it. And then we get to verses 36 and 37. The psalmist knows that opposition will come. He knows that it's not going to be easy. He knows that there's going to be things to distract him and deter him from God's word. And so in, this, in these two verses, he prays against those things. If delight is the goal, the psalmist asks, what's going to hold me back? And he essentially prays, Lord, keep me from those things. Keep me from whatever will hold me back from your holy word. And so the prayer number four is incline me. Prayer number four is incline me. Verse 36, incline me to what? Incline my heart to your testimonies. There he's talking about the heart again. The heart is a pervasive theme throughout Psalm 119. We just saw it back in verse 34. I, I observe it with my whole heart. He says, incline my heart to your testimonies and then away from selfishness. Incline means bend me, turn me. Incline me towards your word rather than selfish gain. Think of the song, Come Thou Fount, that phrase in there that says, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. How true is that of us on a daily basis? We need God to incline our hearts towards his word rather than selfish gain. And Goodness, I mean, think to yourself, what, what is the selfish game that might be keeping you from God's word? What, what are the excuses that you give to get out of reading God's word or studying God's word or memorize God's word? Do they start with, well, I was this, 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 or well, my, oftentimes our excuses always start with ourselves. Right? Because we're selfish people. That's just reality. We need God's help to incline our hearts, to turn ourselves towards God's word, rather than selfish gain. The prayer here, Lord, incline my heart to value you and your word above all others. Incline my heart. Then verse 37, the prayer is, turn me. Incline me, verse 37 is, turn me. This actually is the same word as in verse 36. It's that same in inclination word. This time, turn me away from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. There's a lot of worthless things to look at. There's a lot of worthless things to fix your eyes upon. 
the psalmist says, Oh Lord, in your grace, please turn my eyes from this. This actually maybe is even taking it a step further where he, he doesn't want to be turned to selfish gain, but actually don't even let my eyes see those things that will tempt me to, to be away from your word. I know true abundant life is only found through your ways. And so I might ask you this morning to consider what worthless things might you need to address in your life? What worthless things are my eyes seeing so much of while all the while neglecting the promises of God's word? The application there is endless, and I'm sure it doesn't take any of you very long to think about that, those one or two things in your life that need to be checked Maybe those one or two things that need to be repented of. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Verse 38, he gives us the next prayer. This prayer is one that says, establish me. In the ESV, it says, Confirm to your servant your promise that you might be feared. The New American Standard Bible uses the word establish. And I think that rightly kind of sums up what this verse is getting at. Charles Spurgeon said it this way about this verse. He says, Make me sure of thy sure word, and make it sure to me, and make me sure of it. Let me read that one more time. Make me sure of thy sure word. Make it sure to me and make me sure of it. This idea of confirm or establish means to belong to, to stand in something, to come to fruition, to, to be fixed in something. And so the prayer here is that the psalmist would, would have such confidence in the word of God that the word of God would be his foundation. That would be his bedrock, his go-to the place where he will firmly plant his feet. Confirm to your servant your promise word so that you may be feared. The more we know the word of God, the more we will know the person of God, and the more we understand the person and love of God, the more we will fear him rightly. The more we will respond to him in a healthy way fear of God, rightly acknowledging his wonder and awe, rightly walking in obedience and reverence to him, a healthy fear of God. So he says, teach me, grow me, lead me, incline me, turn me, establish me. Then in verse 39, he says, shield me. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. This word reproach means scorn, insult, or taunting. I think this is once again referring to the response that we get from the world. Okay? When we do these things, when we delight in God's word, when we keep it, when we observe it, the world will mock you. The world will scorn you. The world will belittle you. The psalmist says here, Turn away that reproach which I dread. And remind me that your rules are good. Perhaps it's a nod back to verse 22 when he said, Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your promises. Maybe this is even an application of verse 36, where he says, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfishness. Right? Right? Help me to be more concerned with your holy word than what man will say about me. Shield me. Lord, help me to value your word more than I dread or fear the words of man. But I'm going to lose all my friends. But all my coworkers aren't going to like working. What are you delighting in? Is it all about you or is it all about God? Teach me, grow me, lead me, incline me, turn me, establish me, shield me. In verse 40, 
revive me. Renew me. Literally, give me life. He says, Behold, how I long for your precepts in your righteousness. Give me life. True life only comes through God's word and God's work within us. The world cannot give you the abundant life that God promises. He says, I crave for your words. He recognizes it's only through God's righteousness, his grace, that he will have the abundant life. It's a plea for the grace of God in his life because he recognizes that God's strength is made perfect in his weakness. O oh Lord, I have no life within myself. Revive me with your word. Give me the life that is promised. So we have eight requests. I'll say them one more time. Teach me, grow me, lead me, incline me, turn me, establish me, shield me, and revive me. Notice that these are all things that the psalmist is asking God to do for him. You know, so often, even, even myself, when, when I hear a sermon about just the preciousness of God's word and I'm all motivated to, to dive back into it and, and there I go like doing my three step plan for how I'm going to be a better Christian and how I'm going to read my Bible every day and, and it's just ironic that, that it, automatically I, I turn to my own abilities and my own plans and my own ways and I'm not saying planning is bad we have, you should make a plan in fact I would encourage you to have a plan if you don't have a plan you're probably not going to do much of anything but at the end of the day, it, we, we will not succeed in our own strength. Every single request that we see in verses 33 through 40 is a prayer from the psalmist saying, God, help me. Help me to delight in your holy word. If we want to stay on the path and fulfill God's plan for our lives, one author said we have to be broken and diminished until we recognize that God does not want our ability, he wants our availability. So I'll ask you guys this morning, how much do you delight in God's word? And if you think you have even an ounce or a little ways to grow, hopefully we recognize that we all have a very long ways. And just so you know, it, it never stops until eternity. No matter where you're at in your faith journey, you have room to grow. You have more to learn. You have much to behold. How much are you delighting in God's Word? I want to challenge you guys with something this week. I don't do this very often, but I'd like to challenge you guys to commit to praying each morning. Pick a time in your morning routine. Maybe it's right when you wake up. Maybe it's when you're brushing your teeth. Maybe it's while you're eating breakfast. Whatever it is, pick your time right now. See, we're making a plan. We're still planning. But we're trusting God to help us in this. I would encourage you to commit just this week, the next seven days, each day that you wake up, pray that God would increase your delight in his word. Ask him for help. I would be very curious to see how that one simple prayer might change the progression of your week. That you might come back next Sunday delighting in God's word just a little bit more. Not because you did something, not because you're super spiritual or, or you stuck to, you completed my challenge. But because God and his grace has grown that delight in his word within you. Let's pray. God, we pray this morning that you would teach us your holy word. Only then will we keep it until the very end. Lord, in your grace, give us deeper understanding so that we might not just keep your word, but that also we might observe it with all of our being, with our whole heart. 
Lord, lead us in the path of your commands, for we desperately want to delight in them. Lord, incline our hearts towards your word and away from selfish gain. Turn our eyes away from looking at worthless, empty, vain things. And instead, give us life according to your ways. Lord, establish to your servant your promises. Confirm them to us so that we might fear you all the more. Turn away the reproach that we dread. Help us to remember that your rules are good. Behold, how we long for your precepts. O oh God, in your righteousness, give us life. Lord, we are so amazed by your grace and your love in our lives. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in your holy word. And so as the song says, Lord, amazing love, I know it's true. Therefore, it is my joy to honor you in all that I do. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.